All right, so without further ado, I wanna welcome James Tupper from Martin Law as our guest speaker today. James has over 30 years experience representing industrial and municipal clients on water quality, land use, and hazardous waste issues. He has successfully defended permit challenges, citizen suits, and enforcement actions in federal and state court, and before the Pollution Control Hearing Board and the Shoreline Hearings Board. James has been both an advocate and a judge, he served two terms on the Washington Pollution Control Hearings Board and Shoreline Hearings Board from 1994 to 2001. James has been recognized for his expertise as a Washington super lawyer, and in the Best Lawyers in America, he was named the Best Lawyers 2015 Environmental Litigation Lawyer of the Year in Seattle. So excited to hear from James, and go ahead and take it away. Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and Brandon, thanks for the opportunity to make a presentation today. So um, that, that was a, a great introduction. Thank you so much for it. And just a, kind of a disclaimer, my goal today is not to really provide any legal advice um, uh, on the, the permit to draft or compliance with it. Um, uh, my goal is just to provide you with a perspective for somebody who's been an advocate on issues of the permit and served as a neutral decision maker on the permit, things that kind of stick out to me um, in, in, in the draft permit. Now, certainly, if you have legal questions, you should consult your own uh, legal counsel regarding those questions. But I'm happy uh, to answer questions you have about what you're seeing in the permit and and in addition to what I'm doing, and, and certainly take any questions you have about what I'm presenting. So here's kind of today what I want to go through, just a little bit of background about the permit, um, the permit development cycle, uh, who has to be covered under the permit, uh, some groundwater considerations, emerging chemicals, new compliance conditions, corrective actions, and permit appeals. Um, uh, I think my very last slide or second to the last slide um, in this presentation is uh, about a compliance strategy. And I can't stress that enough. Um, there's a number of changes in this permit. There's potentially a big expansion of um, facilities that have to obtain coverage under the permit. Uh, it really, it, if you're regulating or implementing this permit, it's it's this is a good time to get together with your stormwater team, with your outside consultants and review your stormwater pollution prevention plans, your sampling plan, your inspection forms, your reporting forms, and make sure that you're all geared up um, going into the new year, particularly if you've got some new parameters that you have to test for uh, uh, in the permit. Um, I'm going to come back to that at the end of the permit, but as I go into this, what I'd like to do is go through each of these kind of sections I've got outlined here, outlined here and open it up for any questions that people might have. So raise a hand or, or put a, uh, a, a question in the, in the chat. Brandon will be monitoring those. I, I will not be looking at those as we're going through this, but um, uh, you know, feel, feel free to chime in if you have questions or you have an observation um, about what we're doing. Okay, so with that, let me uh, get into get into the presentation. Um, so just kind of a you know very brief history of stormwater permitting. Um, back in the day, EPA's position was that stormwater constituted nonpoint pollution that was outside the authority of EPA to regulate in the NPDES or National Pollutant Discharge Illumination System permitting under the Clean Water Act. Um, you know, as a result of legal action and congressional action, uh, which led to the adoption of Section 402P of the Clean Water Act, uh, the Clean Water Act required EPA to start issuing municipal stormwater and industrial stormwater um, permits. In that legislation, Congress left to EPA the task of defining what industrial stormwater should be subject to permit coverage. And that um, 
definition uh, uh, was codified in the Code of Federal Registers at 40 CFR 122.26. You see the citation there. And that's kind of a critical thing when we get into who, who has to be covered under the permit. In Washington, ecology uh, holds delegated authority from EPA and has been designated by the state legislature to receive that delegated authority and implement the MPDS permit program on uh, outside of uh, federal and tribal lands within the state. Uh, ecology, like EPA, uh, with, in, with respect to stormwater, has taken the approach of using general permits. So we have the industrial stormwater general permit, the construction stormwater general permit, and the phase one and phase two municipal stormwater permits. And there's also other industries, you know, not industrial, but industry specific permits like the sand and gravel permit, and boatyard permit um, that are out there as well. And the permits, particularly the industrial stormwater general permit is built around uh, primarily um, uh, benchmarks and stormwater pollution prevention plans and best management practices as a way to manage stormwater. So uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about benchmarks today, but their numeric values exceeding a benchmark is not a violation. The violation would come in if you don't take the corrective action to um, address why your discharges are are, are are trending or have gone above above the benchmark. And it's kind of a critical difference between these general general permits and the individual permits. That said, in this draft permit, and um, increasingly we're seeing numeric effluent limits um, for um, certain parameters, certain industries and discharges to certain water bodies, um, you know, uh, in particular the Puget Sound sediment cleanup sites, I'll have a, a numeric limit for total suspended solids. So the permit cycle, per, MPDS permits are issued on a five year term. That's kind of the maximum term, term for an MPDS permit. It has to be renewed every five years. And the individual permit world, um, uh, depending where you're at or what your facility is, you could operate under an administratively extended permit uh, for a number of years before your five-year permit gets renewed. It's a little bit more difficult for ecology or for permitting authority to do that with one of these general permits. If it's administratively continued, then everybody covered under the permit would continue to operate and could operate indefinitely as long as the permit was administratively continued, but there wouldn't be the ability for new entities, new, new permittees to obtain coverage under administrative extension. Um, so what you see in ecology has uh, been really good at this over the last 10, 15 years is the permits will be issued in a timely manner. So uh, there's no administrative extension to the permit. So the current permit was effective on January 1, 2020. Um, so, you know, we're now looking at um, 20, you know, the permit expiring at the end of this year. So Ecology uh, issued the draft permit in uh, the spring of this year and the comment period closed on July 15, and they're in the process of reviewing those comments, taking those into consideration, making changes to the permit where they deem it appropriately, and uh, and most importantly, to develop a, a pretty solid response um, to comments. And the anticipated issuance of that permit would be by December 1st of this year, uh, I think I saw something yesterday where Ecology expects to issue the permit in November. In any case, it, it has to be issued in a manner timely enough so that there's a 30-day window between its issuance and January 1, um, 25, when the permit will be effective. Um, I have here a link to the red line version of the permit. 
And I also put that link in the comments if you want to uh, tap into that while we're talking or or um, uh, you know afterwards. So one of the big issues in this new permit is who has to be covered under the permit. And so I have on this slide the language from the current permit, which is similar to the language in the 2015 permit. And I believe it's the same language from the 2010 permit. And what Ecology did is they adopted by reference that EPA definition of industrial activity. Um, so it covers 11 uh, areas of, of, uh, of industrial activity that have to be covered under the permit. Um, and that led to some um, litigation in the 2020 permit as to what that language meant. Um, there is, within that EPA definition, there's a unique carve out for transportation facilities um, uh, that provides that the industrial activity only applies to those uh, portions or areas of a facility that are engaged in vehicle maintenance. Some other things in there, but shorthand vehicle maintenance. So ostensibly nothing else at the facility would be covered under the permit unless those areas have runoff that's commingled with runoff associated with maintenance activities. Ecology um, going into the 2010 permit and after it interpreted that language to mean that if you're covered under the permit, that is if you have a transportation facility that has vehicle maintenance activities, your entire facility is covered under the permit. That was litigated before the Pollution Control Hearings Board on the 2020 permit, and the board ruled that the plain language of the EPA definition did not expand, the, could not be read to expand the coverage fence line to fence line. Um, that decision of the board was reversed by uh, in the Division I Court of Appeals, and um, last week, the state Supreme Court um, denied a motion for discretionary review to review that. So it, um, with that decision by the state Supreme Court, um, Ecology's previous interpretation un under, under the 2020 permit um, applies. Nonetheless, this draft permit um, has a very different uh, definition of industrial activity. Uh, which is fairly expansive. If you are engaged in industrial activity, um, your immediate access roads and rails lines used to travel, uh, if you're um, handling materials, shipping sites, um, loading docks, um, uh, you know, material handling activities include storage, loading, unloading, transportation, conveyance, and raw material, intermediate product, final product byproduct or waste product. So it's very extensive um, in terms of what this definition is. And one of the sort of adjuncts to this is um, going, that's in the definition section, but if we go back to condition S1, which governs who has to um, apply for coverage, you've got um, a slightly re reworded statement um, to begin condition S1A, uh, the statewide permit applies to facilities conducting industrial activities that directly or indirectly discharge stormwater to a surface water of the state, uh, which includes but is not in, uh, limited to roadside ditches or storm sewer systems. I don't think that's a big expansion of, I don't think that language necessarily makes much of a difference in terms of of what was there before in, in the existing permit. Um, and then S1A uh, states facilities engaged in, in any industrial activities in table one, which are really kind of those uh, 11 types of energies, industries in the EPA definition um, with the addition of, 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 um, of uh, uh, marine construction sites. Uh, uh, 
um, that have to obtain coverage under the permit. And then this is a specific change they made in table one for transportation facilities, which have vehicle maintenance activity, equipment cleaning, material handling slash storage or airport DI, DI scene operations. So the big ad here is the material handling slash storage language um, to the permit. Um, so what does this mean? So uh, if you're, Looking at these two sections of the permit, um, and maybe first start with the lower section that references the table. The big difference uh, uh, will be in terms of transportation facilities that um, currently don't have vehicle maintenance activities, but may be handling material they're suddenly gonna be uh, obligated to obtain coverage under the permit. And this could be significant. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure, you know, my understanding is there are probably hundreds and hundreds of, of transportation facilities that may have to come into the permit. Um, if I read S1A and S1A1 together, that would seem to be the primary impact of this new new definition of industrial activity. Um, but I would point out that the basis for reversing the board, um, and there's also a Ninth Circuit kind of related case that involved a specific enforcement action against the Port of Tacoma. A lot of that turned on the language of S1 that you know it doesn't matter about the industrial definition, doesn't matter about the table. This permit requires and applies to facilities conducting industrial activities. So um, uh, it's just kind of a question mark of whether the way ecology structured this is really going to limit um, uh, who has to be covered under the permit or how big of an expansion on that uh, of the permit there'll be. I, you know, this is an issue that was addressed in comments in the permit. So it'll be really important to look at the response to comments um, on that uh, in the per when the permit is uh, finalized to see exactly how this falls out. Um, so um, let me stop right there before I go on to groundwater and, and Brandon, just ask if there are any questions or any comments about, about that kind of new approach under the permit. There's nothing in the chat right now, but um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or, or put it in the chat. Yeah. So there's, um, uh, in the permit, there's um, uh, there's existing coverage for discharges to ground. So if um, you trigger- yeah, real quick. There was one question came in. Yeah. Um, the question is, do you know if the word directly or indirectly means discharges to groundwater, which I think will lead you into this next topic too. Um, it, it can be, um, and that's kind of addressed in this slide. And there's also another reference, um, in the permit to the Maui County decision of the ninth circuit in the Supreme U S Supreme court. Um, uh, and I can maybe answer that here, just quickly uh, introducing you to the slide and um, and this new new part of uh, one here, which is a discharge to discharge point to groundwater. Um, that's the functional equivalent to a point source discharge to surface water. Nope. So, um, but going back. Uh, in terms of uh, coverage for groundwater discharges, um, if you trigger coverage under the permit because you have a discharge to surface water, uh, if you also have a discharge to groundwater, uh, that that uh, uh, discharge to to groundwater is is um, uh, is covered under the permit. Um, 
generally you don't have to do anything other than to maintain your BMPs relative to that discharge. You don't have to monitor it, um, um, but it's still covered there. Ecology does under another provision of the permit have the ability on a case by case basis to determine under the words of the permit that your discharge to groundwater is a significant contributor of pollutants and they can reg uh, regulate it under under this um, this permit um, so it's possible to do that and um, uh, you know just sort of a structural point you know the Industrial storm or general permit is issued as both a um, NPDES permit, a federal permit under the Clean Water Act and Ecology's delegated authority. It's also issued as a state waste discharge permit. So they can, if they so desire, if you just have a groundwater discharge, they can make you get coverage under the permit if they make that significant contributor pollutant determination. Um, so this language kind of highlights that, uh, but there are uh, uh, two types of facilities or two categories of facilities that are subject to PFAS sampling. Uh, so if you're covered under the permit and you have a groundwater discharge, you're going to have an obligation to monitor for PFAS. Um, the other thing that ecology can do um, is uh, uh, make a determination that your discharge is the functional equivalent to a point source discharge of surface waters. And that's that Maui County case. And um, you know, what I understand about the facts of that case, and it's one of those classic situ situations where bad facts can make bad or difficult law. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, I've spent some time, spent not enough time, some time in Hawaii, but not as much as I'd like to spend there. Uh, the basic geological formations are uh, very deep um, levels of, of fractured basalt volcanic rock. And, um, you know, there's no, there aren't really a lot of areas with a lot of soil where you can uh, discharge something to ground and take advantage of a Vado zone and some that that's the zone between the surface and the top of the groundwater table where you have any kind of treatment capacity with the soils it just all percolates down and in Maui um, they had a underground injection well where they were discharging um, treated um, water from a treatment plant and um, it was either going into that basalt or, you know, um, the city of Lanai, uh, or, uh, uh, yeah, in, on the, the west side of Maui, they used to call it the Venice of, of the Pacific. There's a very high groundwater table. There used to be a lot of canals and wetlands there. So I'm not exactly sure where this discharge went, but when they did a dye test, um, the dye showed up right off um, the coastline within a relatively short period of time. So it was an easy case for the courts to say, well, look, that's the same as a discharge to surface water. Um, so you have to be covered under an MPDS permit. So that's kind of where it gets in. I mean, there are circumstances in Washington where you could be like that. Um, uh, uh, even if you didn't have a surface water discharge, uh, where you've got a very shallow, shallow um, um, uh, distance, or the water table is pretty pretty close to the surface, but that's kind of what that's that's built around. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that PFAS monitoring um, uh, uh, later on. Any questions about that? I think okay. Jane just commented uh, Lahaina, Hawaii. Question. Thank you. <laughs> I misspelled, I was mispronounced that. So um, we have a couple of emerging chemicals that are showing up in this draft permit. So um, 
six PPD uh, QNON um, an additive in tires um, has proven to be extremely toxic to coho salmon. Um, and so there, uh, uh, there is a um, monitoring obligation to that for uh, broadly in transportation facilities. And it's on a um, quarterly basis starting not in 25, but in January of 28. So they'll be in the last two years of the permit cycle. So there's some time to gear up and figure out how to do, do that monitoring. Um, and it doesn't apply to small businesses, which are defined as um, um, businesses, that, independent businesses that have uh, less than, than 50 employees. Um, and then uh, the other one is, uh, um, you know, a whole class of chemicals um, that's getting a lot of attention uh, these days, the PFAS. And so there's two categories that have to do the monitoring uh, with both the PFAS and the 6-PPDQ9. This is monitoring and reporting only. There's no benchmarks in the permit for uh, or 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 the fluid limits for for those those um, uh, for that monitoring and the PFAS mon monitoring applies to air transportation facilities and waste management facilities, including landfills, transfer station, open dumps, and land application sites. Um, on the land application sites, the the draft permit does not apply that to um, land applications for ag agricultural activities or landscaping or the application of domestic sewage bio biosolids. I would note that that limitation for agricultural activities or landscaping is conditioned on it being an agronomic rate. Um, but I'm not sure if that uh, how that applies in the landscaping arena, but maybe maybe it does. But um, so now let's go to new compliance conditions. And this kind of goes back to my uh, one of my initial thoughts. It's also my end thought on this, this presentation. There are a lot of, 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 of tweaks um, to the permit that are in the draft permit. And a little bit of background on this. In the 2020 permit appeal, the Pollution Control Hearings Board granted summary judgment on that coverage for transportation facilities issue. And then uh, the regulated community appellants uh, reached a settlement agreement with Ecology that really centered on the, the deadlines for corrective actions that I'll, I'll be getting to. They reached a separate settlement agreement with Puget Soundkeeper Alliance. They had a lot of these additional compliance conditions in the permit. And um, so it really behooves you to take, really be careful um, and take a look at everything that's new in the permit and so that you're you're up to date on it. There's, there's um, just four of these that kind of stick out for me that I wanted to go over. And the first one is um, the spill log. And so this is under the um, condition S3, which governs the stormwater pollution prevention plans. Uh, and I'm not sure whether this is something that was in the settlement agreement with Puget Soundkeeper Alliance, or this was an ecology staff initiated issue. I know that, um, you know, in my experience with inspectors, there there has been a view that any um, any kind of spotting oil sheen constitutes a spill that has to be addressed, um, and and so you can see that here. So you've got a um, uh, if you've got a release, you've got to um, log it and address it, and there has to be a record for that. And, and in some types of facilities, that, that this condition is potentially going to be a real a real headache. Um, uh, having worked at airports, you know, there's um, uh, 
commuter planes, smaller planes, they're kind of designed to to leak a little bit. So you will get um, little spots of uh, when it rains, you can pick up little spots here and there. And you know it's not uncommon um, with any kind of equipment that has lubricants, uh, be it trains or trucks or uh, any, anything else that you're going to have some material like this. And, you know, you would think that it would be okay to address this with the BMP for uh, housekeeping and, and oil water separators. But um, uh, nonetheless, this is what ecology is proposing. And I think it's going to require some additional attention. Um, employee training, um, uh, I think this one came out of the settlement for Puget Sound Keeper Alliance. Um, you know, for all employees and contractors and vendors have duties um, in the areas of industrial activity subject to the permit. It does have, you know, an out that contractor and vendors may be excluded if the permit he has an employee who has been trained on the SWIP supervising the activity at all times. So that may be a, a real kicker uh, uh, to maintain compliance is to have that staff person around. Because I, I know there's a lot of facilities if you um, have goods goods coming in and going out or, um, you know, you, uh, you've you got, uh, you know, trucks delivering things, you know, a lot of traffic in and out. Um, and there's a lot of people uh, who are not going to be, um, you're not going to be able to train them and track that and maintain it. But um, uh, it's uh, it's a potential new burden, new 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 record uh, additional record keeping requirement for compliance with the permit. Uh, the annual report. So there's a new condition in the annual report requirements under condition S9. Uh, so you have to the annual report shall include, stormwater pollution issues. And I highlighted that here. And this is kind of um, uh, putting into the permit a provision that was in the annual report form that Ecology first generated in 2010, which uh, if you filled out an annual report it says, please discuss any problems we've had in, had in the, in the reporting year. And it's always, ecology never defined, well, what is a problem? Uh, what do I have to report? And now you have this provision that says uh, stormwater pollution issues. So what is a stormwater issue? Um, we're doing monthly inspections. Do I have to then in my annual report note that the inspection in March noted that a uh, dumpster lid was open? Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, pick, pick a BMP that was not, I, I, you know, discovered somebody had left a bucket someplace. We had, you know, things that were just addressed. Just how extensive are those por the stormwater pollution issues that you're supposed to put into this, this annual report? Um, and I also have some concerns from a legal perspective when it's talking about reviews and audits made by consultants or providers of technical assistance. Um, I, I do think people should be able to conduct those type of audits under some um, uh, 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 attorney client, attorney work product privilege without having to necessarily disclose them to the Department of Ecology in this annual report. And so I just point that out. I just may be my sense of being annoyed more than than uh, than anything else. Uh, this one reporting violations um, caught my eye. Typically, in terms of reporting violations, it's always been um, triggered by any violation that poses that that might endanger human health or the environment or is an affluent, if, uh, affluent um, exceedance. So um, there's not gonna be um, a lot of those affluent exceedances because benchmarks are not a numeric affluent uh, limitation. So, you know, maybe with maybe pH or maybe with uh, TSS, if you're discharging to 
uh, Puget Sound sediment cleanup uh, 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 receiving water. But, I, but it really was based on whether I'm doing something that might endanger health and environment. Like I have an oil spill that's got into my outfall. Um, uh, that would be a clear instance. This is um, much more of a bright line. So if, if um, you violate the permit, um, you're supposed to take immediate action to address it, which is you know, also the case under the SWIP and the inspection requirements and the level one, level two corrective, corrective action requirements. Um, and then you have a reporting requirement and the reporting requirement um, seems to be limited to any non-compliance that may endanger, endanger the health or environment or any violation of a, uh, a, a, a daily discharge limit. Um, but then in the same section, it also has this language that you have to submit a detailed written port, report to ecology within five days of the time the permittee became becomes aware of the circumstance. So it it doesn't seem that that section is limited limited to or relates to the um, the written uh, the um, excuse me uh, the twenty four hour. Um, notification requirements to ecology. It it seems to relate to the opening paragraph that if you violate the permit, it would seem that this language is requiring you to submit report to ecology within five days, um, which could be very difficult. So those are, um, there's a lot more of these in the permit. So I'm going to, again, just stop here, uh, Brandon, and see if there's any questions or reactions or there's other provisions that people are seeing along these lines that they want to discuss. Yeah, so there uh, is one question in the chat here. Um, this kind of goes back to the groundwater discussion. Um, it says, does groundwater, sorry, does stormwater discharge to wetlands and biofiltration basins count as discharges to groundwater? Oh, that's a really good question because I was really stewing about that over lunch. Because, um, you know, I'm thinking of so many facilities where I've worked at where, um, you know, on one side of the facility, they have a storm drain that goes to, uh, you know, connects off site to uh, a municipal stormwater drain. But on the other side of the property, it just drains into a swale. Um, and so it's a groundwater infiltration. There's no, there's no catch base and there's no, I, no UIC structure. Um, and I don't have a good answer to that question because if I read the permit, it appears you have to go sample that. If you're a transportation facility, you're supposed to be sampling it for PFOS, but I don't know, you know, how it, it how you set that up for sampling. I suppose it's possible. You have to put something down there to collect a sample unless there's some clarification from ecology about, you know, are we supposed to be sampling UIC structures or anything where stormwater collects and might infiltrate? Any other questions for James on the um, new uh, permit requirements? Any concerns from from other topics on that that anyone's seeing? Um, someone said they're looking up the the draft citation. So hold on just a second. <laughs> Anybody okay. else? Maybe you can keep going, and we'll we'll come back yeah. to that question. Yeah, well, yeah, don't hold, yeah, don't hesitate to to bring your to bring your question up. We'll we'll have time for more questions at the end. Um, so corrective action. So uh, this is um, one area that um, where the regulated entities on the 2020 permit appeal were able to. Um, uh, reach agreement with ecology and, and that agreement and also with the PSA agreement. So um, the agreement with this ecology was that they would issue um, 
the agreed language in a draft permit. Um, ecology was clear as it had to be that it was not an agreement to actually adopt anything in the final permit um, because they, um, uh, the, you know, the agency can't legally predetermine what's going to be in the permit. They have to put it out for public notice, opportunity to comment, and look at those comments in good faith. So that applies to, um, you know, the conditions I just went through to the extent that those were part of the PSA settlement agreement. Um, and it would also apply to um, the three bullets I have, have about corrective actions here. Um, well, the third only would apply to the third bullet here about the level three um, uh, deadline. And um, this was uh, 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 is a really good add to the permit from my experience. You know, currently the permit requires you to submit um, an engineering report by May 15th for a level three corrective action. And then it gives you a deadline of September 30th to um, implement that corrective action. And, and the difficulty in practice on that, particularly if it's a large site or medium site, I, um, uh, you have to mobilize from the engineering report. You've got to mobilize to um, purchase the components of your corrective action to develop the actual plans to install it and mobilize to do that. And you may get to June or July and ecology says, no, we don't like your engineering report. We don't like that approach. We want you to do something else. Well, then you're really jammed because you're out the expense you've already gone through to implement your, your corrective action, but now you've got to redo it. And your chances of meeting the deadline in September are you know are, are uh, not uh, not really feasible at that point. So what ecology um, has done, and this actually wasn't anything that the regulated community proposed to ecology. This was their approach, and I think it's a really good one. So that um, the deadlines um, remain the same. Well, I think the engineering report instead of being doing May fifth. 15th is due in June, six months out. Um, but you still have a deadline of September 30th to implement the level three corrective action unless the action requires approval of an engineering report. And if that's the case, you go to September 30th and the, the second following year. So if in 24, I, I triggered a level three corrective action, Instead of my deadline being September 30th, 2025, it will now be September 30th, 2026. And this is a this is a really good add to the permit and would be, you know, mesh the experience on the ground with a lot of clients I've dealt with and with ecology in terms of the time needed to review and, and finalize engineering reports and 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 start um mobilizing for construction. A um, couple of other changes to condition S8. Um, the deadline for request for a waiver of extension rather than being May 15th of the following year goes to the deadline and the permit for the corrective action. So uh, for a level two corrective action, you've got to get in a waiver extension request before the deadline in August. Likewise, for um, a level three, you've got to get it in September 30th of the following year or, or the second year um, on that, um, which is a good one. This, this second bullet here, um, uh, as I read the language in the draft permit, um, it, it appears to now provide that if you trigger a level two, uh, you stay at level two until the deadline to implement your corrective action. So uh, if I in, if in 2024, I triggered a level two in the first and second quarter, 
um, well, this wouldn't be true in 24. Let's say if this stays in the permit in 2025, I schedule, I, I uh, trigger a level two corrective action by exceeding a benchmark in the first and second quarter. Uh, under this language, I would stay at um, level two all the way through to um, August um, 30, 31 of, of 26. The way the permit reads, as I understand it, is if I trigger a level two in the first two quarters and then I exceed the benchmark in the, the third quarter or fourth quarter, I now go into the next year at a level three um, corrective action obligation. So um, some big changes there. I think that'll improve the corrective action process. Any questions um, about about uh, the corrective action uh, uh, condition SA changes in, in the draft permit? I do have one going back with um... Going back to infiltration again, hot topic. Uh, this question is, if a solid waste slash transfer station facility doesn't need coverage under the current permit because it has 100% infiltration, would it need coverage under the new permit because of the six PPD and PFOS sampling requirements? Um, so my impression on this and uh, it's definitely something to get a, get independent legal advice on it. But my impression on uh, on that is you would not trigger coverage under this permit. If you're not covered under the permit and you don't have a discharge directly or indirectly to a surface water, uh, you don't have to, uh, you, you're not obligated to get coverage under the permit. Ecology can come to you and say, you know, um, we want you to monitor your ground your, your impact of groundwater. So we're going to make a significant contributor pollutant determination, uh, and then you're going to have to apply for coverage under the permit. Or they might ask you to voluntarily, hey, we're going to go do that, or you're going to go go apply apply for coverage. Um, you know, alternatively, ecology could say, you know, you've got these UIC structures, uh, PFAS are a potential issue with your facility. Um, we're going to require some monitoring or we're going to issue you a, a state waste discharge permit and um, require you to be, you know, to handle it that way. Uh, one more question here. Um, it says, if a facility has received a C&E conditional no exposure, does ecology have the ability to retract their letter of coverage and request an agency apply for ISGP coverage, or would the five-year CME coverage letter stand? Uh, I, th I if they've made it and it's for five years, I think it stands. Um, uh, um, I don't have that covered in here, but one of the changes ecology made to the permit on the conditional non-exposure is it it um the way the permit was written was that uh, conditional non-exposure was automatic um after 60 or 90 days if ecology didn't respond to an application mm -hmm. yeah. so now it's structured so that ecology has to review and approve it there's no automatic um conditional non-exposure um it's a uh, kind of a troubling change in the permit um if this permit is going to lead to a really vast expansion of the facilities covered under the permit because it, it may really impair ecology's ability to respond to cne applications um on the other hand i don't know that there were very many uh conditional on exposures uh statuses that um resulted from ecology's failure to act. I think ecology is kind of on those and has been on those when they came in. So I don't know if it makes a big difference, but I do think if you've got a term and a conditional non-exposure from ecology, that stands. There's nothing in this permit that 
that alters that. Okay, we got uh, two more quick ones here. Um, this one's maybe more of a more of a comment. It says the corrective action level two or three level can't be determined until the end of the year. A permittee can only be in level two if they have exceedances after all annual quarterly samples are collected. This is a confusing issue that ecology should have clarified. Yeah. I I agree with you, and I guess I'm not... Uh... I'm not uh, I'm not quite certain that the proposition is entirely correct. I, you know, I stand to be corrected um, if others have different experience or different views. But if if I put the scenario together that um, uh, I triggered a level two in the first two quarters of the year, um, I, I think my obligation to a I'm in level I, I have an, a level two corrective action obligation I've got to proceed with at that point. Um, uh, I have not understood that to be I have to wait till all four quarters to see if I'm in a, a level two or not. That said, if the 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 questioner is correct on that. Um, then, uh, you know, what I have here on the level two um, uh, safe harbor may make no difference at all um, if you have to wait till the end of the year to determine what corrective action uh, level you're in. Um, it's, it's, you know, the, that change in the languages doesn't make any difference. So, I, you know, invite anybody who's got thoughts on that to speak up or, um, uh add in add on it but that's kind of an important question to be to be thinking about um i know we're running a little short on time i mean to keep going with some questions here yeah um so i don't know if you i, I know what he's referencing here um, in the last public workshop he says um can you explain your interpretation of corrective action triggers by site versus by outfall Ecology mentioned that corrective action levels should be counted by site. Yeah, uh, I I recall hearing that, and um, it's uh, it's really confounding, and it's not very practical in my view. Um, and, and here's why. So um, I've got a site with three outfalls and um, uh, uh, and and think of some think of various permutations of what happens over the course of the year. So I have one exceedance for um, uh, uh, I have an exceedance of zinc at one outfall, uh, and I have an exceedance for copper. Uh, one time at the other two outfalls. So uh, from what I understand, it called you a saying in that workshop is, well, now you're in level three. But it's um, it's a little bit goofy because uh, if that's all I had and they weren't very big exceedances, um, I'm basically going to do a level one corrective action. I'm going to identify and correct you know, what was going on, um, and I'm going to be successful. And if I have to do a level three, you know, what I'm going to say is, okay, here's my level three action. I I, I found that um, somebody had stored these zinc bars outside, or, um, you know, we, we set with, you know, this downspout had a problem off of this roof so we put a sock at the end of that downspout to get rid of that zinc problem the copper is associated with this with that the very you know very straightforward housekeeping bmps or maybe there's some structural bmps that did it um you know what's the point of having a level three corrective action you know another scenario is i've got those three outfalls and i have um uh uh no exceedances at out, outfalls one and two 
and I have uh, three exceedances from minor to you know large for copper at the one outfall. You know, my approach to my my corrective action would be to do a level three corrective action to address copper at the problematic outfall, but to um, in the engineering report report we're not doing anything in you know the catch patients for outfall for the other two outfalls because they're not going to have a problem. So, um, you know, it doesn't make engineering sense from resources or the environmental consequences of having to do a level three treatment action to suddenly say, well, all three outfalls need to have uh, uh, stormwater level three treatment systems installed. Um, uh, but that's that's kind of how I've been looking at that. I, I, hopefully that's responsive to your question. Um, there was a <clears throat> response to the level two or three not being able to be identified until the end of the year. Yeah. Basically said, that's been my experience, uh, has an opinion on that one too. I'm sorry, what was that, Brandon? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, he responded, that's been his experience, how how he described it, and that he has an opinion about that one too. Yeah, so that you have to, so they look at it on an annual basis. Uh, another question here. Well, let me let me just stop there. So that's kind of an important an important point. So you know, um, you know, uh, uh, don't necessarily take my view on that. Uh, as the proper reading, because that that questioner may be absolutely right, and so it's an important thing to determine. Yeah, might might be something to get clarity yeah. from all of you on. Um, so this is talking about the spill prevention emergency cleanup plan. There's a new sentence at the end of the paragraph talking about storing all hazardous substances, petroleum, oil, etc., that have potential to contaminate stormwater on an impervious surface that is surrounded with a containment berm capable of containing 10% of the total enclosed tank volume or 110% of the volume in the largest tank. New sentence, stormwater conveyance systems cannot be used as part of the secondary containment calculation. This is confusing on what this sentence mean in the context of this section. Does this mean that conveyance piping and oil water separator volumes can't be used when doing this calculation. I know that's a lot. Did you? Yeah, and I and I have to pass on. I have to pass on that that question because, um, um, you know, the spill prevention plans are are something that usually are handed to the stormwater people. Uh, but it's a you know it's a it's a good question to ask, uh, and so I'm not really clear on the circumstances where stormwater conveyance would be used to calculate secondary containment. Um, one other question here. Is there any indication that ecology will change track, change tack with the final permit? Limit expansion, clarification of vague language, et cetera. I do not have any indication on where ecology is going um, at this point. Um, you know, I I assume um, that on the one hand they honored their the settlement agreements I've discussed, um, but I you know assume that they're going to. Um, take into consideration the comments they've received received about all of the conditions in the permit um, uh, you know the favorable decision from the court of appeals and the denial of review by the supreme court on the coverage for transportation facilities so um, i don't know what they're going to do but i know they're going to do a thorough job looking at the comments and and, and responding to them as as they see appropriate and hopefully, you know, lay out uh, exactly the rationale for their decision-making and the response to comments. I, I just want to add to that. I did talk with the new permit writer. She said one of her goals is to uh, clarify vague language. Now, what that ends up looking like, I'm not sure, but 
she did have that at least on her mind. Yeah. All right. Uh, sorry, it's uh four o'clock. I I know James said he can keep going if if people are willing to stay. I just wanted to. Uh, yeah. To know if they need to need to leave. And I'm about done too, so um, I could I could end here or just keep going, whatever you want, Brandon. Yeah, I'm I'm fine if you want to just just finish up your presentation. And if there's any any last questions that come in. Yeah, good. I'll just go kind of quickly over this because um, there was a question in advance of today about the appeals process. So um, this permit is subject to an administrative appeal, and and. That would go to the Pollution Control Hearings Board. The deadline for filing um, that appeal is 30 days from the date of issuance. So, if, you know, if it's issued on December 1, you've got to get it in on, on the, um, the 31st of December. Um, uh, a stay can be requested in the Notice of Appeal by motion. There's no automatic stay. Um, it is difficult to get a stay of a provision in an MPS permit, but that is available by statute and under the board's rules. Uh, a hearing on any appeal would be set um, anywhere from a year to a year and a half from the day from when um, the appeals are filed. Um, the proceedings before the Police Control Hearings Board um, look and feel very much like a trial in Superior Court. The board follows procedure, its own procedural rules and also the civil rules for the Superior Court. So there's discovery and motions practice and an evidentiary hearing and witnesses and and and, um, and testimony and, and, and briefing. Um, and then following the, the any ruling from the board is then subject to, ju to judicial review under the State Administrative Procedures Act. And, that would go to Thurston County Superior Court, or if it's a significant issue, directly to the Court of Appeals for review. Um, and I can't remember, I think every in, version of the Industrial Stormwater General Permit has been appealed. I don't think there's been a permit issued that hasn't been appealed by someone. Um, okay, odds and ends, benchmarks and affluence. Uh, Benchmarks have not changed. Um, there are some new effluent limits for discharges to 303D listed waters. So there's some actual values for like copper. Um, those only apply if you're discharging to a water body that's impaired for copper. It doesn't apply to every discharge to a 303D water body. Um, you may have no noted this year that Ecology adopted new aquatic life toxic criteria, which includes criteria for PFAS and 6-PPDQ non. Um, it has a new approach to deriving, or a new standard for copper and how that would be used to derive um, uh, 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 effluent limits or even benchmarks for copper. Um, those criteria before they're in effect will have to be approved by EPA. And so that's not going to happen between now and January 1. So those new criteria will not go into this permit. You'll see them in the 2030 permit at the earliest. There's a case to watch um, uh, from the city of San Francisco, which is a challenge to an MPDS permit that had a narrative condition that in addition to everything else in the permit, you cannot cause or contribute to a violation of water quality standards, which is kind of a critical thing um, because uh, our permit has that condition as 10. So if you do everything under the permit, you're still subject to an enforcement by an agency or a third party if they can say, well, despite everything, you're causing to contribute to a violation of water quality standards. So that'll be an important case to watch. The Supreme Court has granted um, uh, a certiorari or, or review on that and probably be argued sometime this year or next year. We may see a decision on it by June. Um, so that would be a really important decision for general permits and MPDS permits in general. Another action to watch is the Northwest Seaport 
Alliance petition for um, certiorari before the Supreme Court. And this comes out of that uh, Port of Tacoma Clean Water Act enforcement action. And one of the issues in that case is whether third parties can, in, in the context of a citizen suit, can challenge you for being in violation of a state-only requirement in an MPDS permit. Um, where this case may be really relevant is on this uh, new definition of industrial activities, um, because it appears ecology is expanding coverage under state authority, which it has authority to do. Um, but if that's the case, um, uh, uh, depending on whether the court grants review, um, uh, it may not be that anybody in violation of that can be sued under the Clean Water Act, because there's no private right of action for a state waste, start, waste discharge permit. Where the law stands on that in the Ninth Circuit, which is the Federal Court of Appeals that covers Washington State, um, all conditions of an MPDS permit, whether they're state only or Clean Water Act requirements, are subject to enforcement um, by third parties. So that's going to be an important case to watch um, its, its way work through the system. Um, so then I, this, this is just end on this note, kind of where it began is, um, you know, if you're not covered under the permit right now, you know, determine if this new industrial definition is gonna require coverage uh require coverage and i do think it's important to be reviewing your swip your staffing responsibilities and training and i'll just emphasize again that where i see the agencies taking enforcement action and i see citizen suit actions it's almost always a case where um uh staff changed and um the person taking the lead on the stormwater compliance disappeared or um, they just weren't doing their job. So I think it's really important to evaluate your staffing, be working collaboratively if you're management or you're in the, storm, the stormwater team to be in communication to make sure that you're doing everything that's required under the permit. It's a lot, but if you get it set up correctly and um, there's a lot of great consultants out there uh, who you can tap into to get things set up properly. Uh, you're almost bulletproof from any enforcement actions and citizen suit actions. So uh, I'm going to stop now and take any questions And uh, at this point. All right. There was one more comment on back to that level two when that yeah. has to be determined. Um, I think kind of the opposite interpretation is the is the first commenter it says the permit has la limited language regarding a level two trigger. It simply says that two exceedances within a calendar year triggers level two. If I have two exceedances by June, then I'm bound by level two requirements, which includes what you call the safe harbor. Yeah, the permit does not say to wait until the annual report. It does not say that anyone, including ecology, has authority to further interpret that language. All right. Well, so. <laughs> did I put that comment in? I mean, the uh, I, I, you know, I kind of lean towards that, but you know, I don't want. I'm not going to put a pin in, in any questions here today because these are really, really important questions to take a hard look at and verify. And it's. Um, uh, you know, whether whether it's through the stormwater center or otherwise, we should seek guidance from, uh, well, we should make, uh, in the first instance, our own in, interpretation. And it's suggested by that comment and question you just raised, Brandon. I like the approach of defining what compliance is based on your understanding of the four corners of the permit and the plain language and positioning that to ecology uh, rather than ask ecology in the first instance to find it. But I, I do think it's an important question to be tracking. Yeah. Uh, another question here. Yeah. When ecology comes out for an inspection to decide if a site does or does not fall under the industrial permit, 
or so, sorry, will ecology come out for an inspection to decide if a site does or does not fall under an industrial permit? How is that decision made? Knowing that the site is not covered under an industrial, under an indis industrial permit because it discharges to a biofiltration basin or a wetland. Um, I, I guess th my answer to that would be, I would hope that ecology would be in communication with the facility and conduct an inspection and, and ask for information. Um, uh, I don't know that ecology will always do that. And I'm kind of trying to go back in my my brain here about about cases um you know i think i've had a, I, I think i've seen a couple of instances in in um eastern washington where ecology you know didn't do much other than dry, do a drive by and you know conclude your parking lot you know, runs off into uh, a swale, a depression that um, can't really call it an intermittent stream, but um, during extreme storm events carries water. Um, so it has the potential to discharge to surface water. So therefore we want you to have coverage under the permit. Um, you know, I've seen those, um, I frankly just, I have not seen a lot of a lot of situation where ecology's exercise the significant contributor of pollutant uh, determinations to uh, require somebody to get coverage. Um, and even that case I was just mentioning in in Eastern Washington, well, I mean, most of the time their runoff would just infiltrate. Um, it wouldn't be in surface water except during extreme events. I have um, more frequently seen situations where um, uh, people, a, a facility has applied for a conditional non-exposure because they don't have a surface water discharge. And ecology has did not, uh, well, actually, I mean, it's not a conditional non-exposure. They applied for termination of coverage because they don't have a discharge to surface water and ecology has come out and taken a look at it and said yeah you've got a discharge to groundwater that we're concerned about so we're going to keep you under the permit and i will say in that circumstance ecology did no testing they just did a site inspection saw pollutant sources saw that those might infiltrate and said no we're not going to let you out from under the permit They did leave open the possibility for that one particular facility. You go test it and collect the data and come back to us and demonstrate that you're not impacting groundwater and we'll reconsider your application. All right, any other questions? I'm gonna add um, James's contact information again in the chat so that's readily available. Good. Looks like maybe one more come has come in. Do they consider an exceedance any test that goes over the benchmark? For example, I was over on my copper levels for the first quarterly test, but was able to get it below benchmark before the end of the first quarter. Then I go over the benchmark for copper in the third quarter, but again, and I'm able to get it below the benchmarks. Would this still trigger a level two or level three corrective action? Would it not be required because we're able to get below the benchmarks for the quarter? I th you know, that's going to be a really a site specific uh, determination for your, your facility. So, you know, one thing is um, when you say we were, we were, all, we, you, know, you had exceedance, but by the end of the quarter, you did not have an exceedance. So you're taking two samples. So, one thing initially is um, to think about is in under the permit, you can average your results. So if you get a hit and then 
be to sample it two or three more times is the average of the three. So that may bring bring you below on an average basis and you would not trigger a level one corrective action. Um, if you're having this situation, you you let's say you can't average it out, you got to hit the first quarter. You're at level one, you got to respond to it. You did it, it seems to be working. Level, you do it in a second quarter, you do it. Um, you're, that really factors into your level two response um, because if you get you know the third and fourth quarter and you're like, yeah, this is what we did in terms of housekeeping, it's working. So our level two uh, level two response is going to maintain those those actions. Um, uh, I you know however that is phrased, I, I think that is a legitimate response to to the situation. All right, I think we got maybe one last question here, um, kind of talking about the overlap between the municipal and industrial. It says, if an authority slash agency has an MS4 permit and has developed a SWIP for a facility, would they also be required to apply for ISGP coverage? And if they have a what type of facility? Um, so I, I think it's asking, I think that's probably the question um, that probably depends, or that's probably the answer. It probably depends on the facility, but if they have an MS4 permit and have developed a SWIP for a facility, would they also be required to apply for ISGP coverage? Good question. Uh, if, if that facility is subject to coverage under the permit, um, then I would say, yes. Yeah. So if I'm, you know, um, the if I'm Gotham City and I'm covered under the phase phase two permit and I have a uh, vehicle maintenance yard with a, a vehicle maintenance a, a vehicle a yard for equipment and I've got vehicle maintenance on there it's a transportation facility with vehicle maintenance and I have to get coverage under the permit. All right, that is. All of the questions in the chat. I want to thank thank James for uh, joining us and and having such great answers and a great presentation. Um, also, thanks for for staying on a little a little long, James. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks, Brandon. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, I, uh, if I can answer uh, questions, uh, pointers, I'm happy to do it. F feel free to reach out. I'm happy to be a resource. Um, uh, uh, you know, without being being a client or anything, just you know, if I if I can uh, be somebody, if if I'm if I can be a resource to bounce things off, of, feel free to give me a call. Yeah, thanks, James. Okay, thank you.